Go ahead and have a seat if you would. We worship him and him alone, but we celebrate the Astros today too. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's funny, the 930 service, I went through the whole service, forgot all about even mentioning it. I thought I'm gonna get this done right out of the top and you know, it was a great night, great series, and it was great fun. And I see a lot of you wearing orange, and it was great fun. And probably you, some of you don't have a voice today, but that's okay, too. I hope I keep mine. I don't yell a lot at games. I'm kind of passive, but I enjoy watching it. It was, it was great, great fun. Um, we've been talking in a series. This today kind of, it doesn't wrap up our series entirely, but it kind of does. We've kind of come full circle with the message today. And we've, we've talked about the attack on several age, a, a areas in our culture. We talked about the attack on the family and the attack on children. Today, we're going to talk about the attack on religious liberty. Now, religious liberty is one of the most important and misunderstood principles, freedoms that we have. And to help us understand it, we're going to watch a short video. It's very short. It's a member of our church. And she has a perspective on freedom that most of us in this room, very few of us in this room have because of her background. Listen to what she says, and then we'll build off what she says. I lived in Houston for 22 years. I uh, fled from China, but I cannot show my face because I'm concerned of my family's safety back in China. In that region, you do not have any freedom. You do not have any choice. You don't have a free speech. You don't have a free religions. And we have churches, but those are church leaders, they are communist party member. If you have a Bible study, which is unauthorized, they consider that as a crime. You can be arrested. And I came to the United States just for not only freedom and all for, all for the American dream and a fair chance. And uh, this country has become more and more like communist. I can see what's happening here now and which this country is getting divided. That's not what I wanted to see this country become. As Americans, I think we should wake up now. We should see the big picture of what is coming. We cannot be influenced by the social media and by the media, what they told us. And we have to use our critical thinking to see the truth, to dig a little bit, to spend a little more time and focus on what's going on. As Christians, we also called to stand up, to face the evil, to fight with the devil, and to not be silenced in front of evil. And that's what, what we're supposed to do as a Christian now. I would say she has a take on religious liberty that most of us do not have. Advocates for religious liberty, strong advocates that stand up for religious liberty in our culture today are now being labeled as bigots and as intolerant people. And that's alarming for this reason. It's alarming because up until just recently, religious liberty and fighting for and standing for religious liberty was a complete bipartisan issue. Both parties, both major political parties stood for it. Now, I want to read you quotes from our last four presidents. Listen, in 1998, Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton said, the right to worship according to one's own conscience is essential to our dignity as human beings. In 2008, George W. Bush said, the freedom to worship according to one's conscience is one of our nation's most cherished values. In 2012, President Barack Obama said that religious liberty is a universal human right. In 2019, President Donald Trump said the right to religious freedom is an aid to the dignity of every human person and is foundational, foundational to the pursuit of truth. In spite of these across the aisle statements about religious liberty and religious freedom, there are more and more attacks happening recently on our religious freedom and our religious liberties. As America becomes more and more secularized, there are certain elements of the secularization that put, push against religious liberty. What, what is religious liberty? I found the definition this week I like. Let me just tell you the definition. By the way, the first half of this message, I'm gonna talk about this, and then we're gonna look at a character from scripture in the second half of the message, it helps us know how to live in any culture. 
But what is religious liberty? Religious liberty is the freedom to hold religious beliefs of one's choice, but that's not all. Listen to the second half. And to live in accordance with those beliefs. So, so it's the liberty, if religious liberty is the freedom to hold religious beliefs of one's choice and to live in accordance with those beliefs. So it's not some peripheral issue, some peripheral political issue. It relates to our deepest convictions and then our ability and freedom as citizens to live out those convictions. Now, why is that so important? It's important because religious belief cannot be forced on people. It cannot be coerced. You can't make someone believe something. That's the reality. Truth has to be heard and received and then believed. Go, go read through the Gospels. Look at the life of Jesus. You will not find one time in Jesus' life where he forced someone to believe in him. The truth was always presented, but he never forced them. Go look at Paul, the greatest evangelist ever. What, what did Paul do? Paul would converse with people. He would dialogue with people. He would persuade people based on the Old Testament. That was his method. That's what he did. He reasoned with people. Christianity is a thing of the heart. It must be believed, a thing of the heart and the mind, but it cannot be forced. You can force people to live a certain way, but you can't force them to believe a certain way. Two different things entirely. And, and so we can't force religion on people. It's why our founders did not want a church to go with the state. That, in fact, that's what they were fleeing. They didn't want the state to have a church attached to it where, they were, where it was forced on people. Why? Because you cannot force beliefs on people. That's the idea. They wanted a people that were free to believe and free to live out those beliefs in real life. But there's a battle that's raging today. Al Mohler says in his book, The Gathering Storm, we're now witnessing a great and inevitable collision, listen, between religious liberty and newly declared and invented sexual liberties. And the secular culture is trying to enforce or push its worldview on people who do not agree with it. In other words, saying you must agree with what we say. You must go along with what we say about uh, same-sex marriage. You must go along with what we say about abortion. If you do not, you lose all your other rights. We're imposing our views on you. And all the things I've read say, and the people that understand the court systems, that's where our big battle is going to take place. Between this idea of sexual freedoms and religious liberty. And indeed, it's already happening. And Moeller says this in that book. He says, I posit that we cannot understand the transcendent value of religious liberty without these three essential words. God, truth, and liberty and in that order, he says there, there can be no lasting defense of religious liberties unless we put these three words together and hold them together in that order. So let me just quickly go through those three. First, he says we start with God. Alexander Solzhenitsyn spoke of hearing older Russians talk about what happened with all the horrors of Russia and what went wrong. And, and here's the quote and, and what, the old, what the older people had said to him and expressed to him, men have forgotten God that's why all this has happened. Now, if you listen carefully to what that lady said in our video a moment ago, the lady from China that now lives here, she's saying essentially the same thing. Men have forgotten God in our culture, and that's why we see the troubles that we see in our culture today. We're living in an age where secularization is being, and being fast-forwarded. It's especially true among the intellectual elites. And when I think about the intellectual elites and how they've become so secular and God has been totally removed from the picture, every time I think about them, I think of the verse in Romans chapter 1, verse 22. And the verse says this, professing to be wise, they became fools. Because scripture says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So first there's God, and then Moeller says, coupled with God is truth. That the truth might be the word that's most significant in our Declaration of Independence that has been forgotten today. Listen to what the Declaration says. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A, a, def a defense of religious liberty and all these evident liberties that come out of it is predicated on the assertion of truth 
not on the assertion of opinion or of judgment or of values, because we know how transient those values have become. The worldview that will sustain liberty is a worldview that's established on truth, not on wishful thinking, not on opinions, not on what we think. Francis Schaeffer said more than 50 years ago, and you've heard me quote him a lot in this series, but Francis Schaeffer more than, said more than 50 years ago that the day would come when we would have to declare our belief in true truth. In other words, he was saying there's going to come a day when people won't believe in any truth and you will have to stand up and say, I believe in truth. I believe in true truth. We're there. We've talked about it in this series a lot, that there are people who do not believe in true truth. It's funny, on the way in this morning, Josie and I were driving in, and I was thinking about this section of the sermon just kind of mulling over in my head as we drove. And I thought about those that say there is no such thing as truth and the absurdity of that. And so if you think about it, just maybe that's you, maybe that's someone you know, but think about it. So you believe there is no absolute truth, that there's no true truth? Do you believe that absolutely? Is your belief that there is no truth a truth? It, it, you understand it's a self-defeating argument. It cannot be true. There's, it's an impossibility. There is truth. The Constitution was based on these self-evident truths, not on opinions or values. If there's no truth, then there's no liberty. And the third word he ties in is the word liberty. The founders not only asserted truth claims, they defended liberties. They said the purpose of government is this. The purpose of government is to secure these rights, to secure these rights, not to invent rights, not, not to create rights, not even to discover rights, but, but to secure the rights that preceded any government. Rights given by God that came long before any state, any government of man came along. These are rights given by God. And so man can't invent rights to go with God's rights. Religious freedom is the truly first liberty, the first freedom, because without it, all other liberties are just brittle. That's reality. So we, we have to defend the right of Christians to believe the conviction of our heart, but not just believe it, but to live it out, to live it out in our families. We've talked about the push against that, to live it out in our families. The state has no right to tell us how to live in our families. To live it in our church and not have the world's views forced on us as a church, to live it in our institutions, in our Christian schools, to live out God's truth. Religious liberty is being redefined as some, uh, instead of being religious liberty, as being um, the right to worship, the freedom to worship. But do you hear the difference in those two things? See, even dictators, even in China, she referred to, the lady in the, referred to the fact that in China, they could go worship, but don't you dare go out into public and express your view. You better keep your mouth shut about what you believe. You have no right to speak it. That's the idea. And, and so there's this push for for the right to worship, but not the right of religious liberty, of religious freedom, where you not only believe it, but you live it out in your real life. There's a big difference in those two things. Muller says this, the very freedom to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ is at stake, and thus so is the liberty of every American. Human rights and human dignity are temporary abstractions if they're severed from the reality as gifts of their creator. These are gifts of our creator. The eclipse of Christian truth will lead inevitably to a tragic loss of human dignity. If we lose religious liberty, all other liberties will be lost one by one. No God, no truth, no truths, no liberty, no liberty, and nothing remains but the heel of someone's boot. And if that sounds exaggerated, then you're not listening to people like the lady in the video today who have experienced it and know what she's talking about. The Declaration of Independence speaks of the laws of nature and of nature's God. The founders claimed a higher source than themselves, and they said there are these natural rights that were pre-political, they were pre-government of any kind, because they're God-given. You ask how this happened, Solzhenitsyn was right. It happened because man's forgotten God. And that's where we find ourselves in culture today. So, so what do we do? Because this is where we are in our culture, that religious liberty is under attack, and it is a huge issue, whether you realize it or not, because all of our other issues hinge on this issue. So what do we do? Francis Schaeffer asked it this way in a book he wrote years ago, How Should We Then Live? 
Let me give you three things. First two are really simple. You can do the first two in the next day or two. The first one is, if you have not voted, go vote on Tuesday. If you don't go vote, you have no right to complain to anybody. Go vote. It's your responsibility. So if you're over 18, go vote. Secondly, I want to tell you about something, and you probably have already heard this in Bible study today, but we're having an event tonight where we're going to celebrate our country. We're going to worship God. We're going to sing together. And we're in our, in inner space in our different music. We're going to pray together, pray for our country. It's going to be at our Woodway campus. All six of our campuses are coming together. You'll hear more about it at the end of the service, but I hope you'll come and be a part of that tonight. It's at 5 o'clock tonight. There's going to be a 300-voice choir. I'll let you in on a secret. Uh, Chris is going to sing a solo tonight. I won't tell you what it is, but Chris is going to sing a solo tonight, so you want to come and hear Chris. And Jeff's going to lead our orchestra at one point. There's going to be, and Patrick Worsham is as well. There's going to be a huge orchestra and choir. It's going to be a great night of celebration and worship at 5 o'clock at Woodway. Come be a part. Also, we're going to sit together as a North Campus, and we've been given a huge assignment. Check out this slide. Okay, that's the Woodway Worship Center. So that's the ground floor. You see the yellow over here on the right? That's the, here's the stage. I'm looking out as if I were the pastor looking out on the right side. That's where the North Campus is seating. We'll have three signs that say North Campus. Come sit with us. We're going to sit together for this celebration tonight. So I hope you'll come and be a part. 5 o'clock. I've seen the program. It should be one hour long. We'll be out at 6. You'll be home not before dark, because it's getting dark early tonight. That's a whole, whole other issue. But come be a part. It's going to be a great night. I hope you'll come and sit with us. Um, they've given us a great response. We have half the worship center at Woodway to fill tonight on the first floor. 1463 uh, West, Cypress, South, those four campuses were given those little measly balconies, and they give us half the first floor. So they think a lot of us. So let's go and be a part of tonight, and uh, let's celebrate together. Here's the third thing I want to say to you. Now let's get to God's word and see what God's word says. I, I, I want us to see from someone in scripture who shows us how to live in any culture at any time in a way to give God glory. I'll tell you about him and you'll, most of you will figure out who he is. And if not, you need to know who this character is. He was taken from his home when he was a teenage boy. Had a, came, in a, came from a godly culture, taken from his home, taken to Babylon, educated in a foreign culture. But even as he did this in chapter one of the book about him, the book of Daniel, we see this young teenage boy live his life with incredible conviction and with incredible composure and with unbelievable common sense. One translation says he lived with wisdom and tact. That's a great combination. But what I want you to see this morning is a simple message. What I want you to see this morning is the secret to Daniel's extraordinary life. And he did have an extraordinary life. Daniel 6 is the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Most of you know the story of Daniel and the lion's den. If you do not, spoiler alert, the lions did not eat him. Okay, he made it out of the lion's den. But Daniel, when he was put in the lion's den, most of us, or a lot of us, have this impression he was a young guy then. He was not. He had already served in the administration of Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonian Empire and had great success in serving Nebuchadnezzar there in this, in this godless culture. But God had gifted him in an incredible way. And now he's a mature, he's a mature adult, and, and he's now serving in the reign of Darius, the reign of the Medes and Persians. And, and, and even though he's in a whole new... I mean, these are the most powerful kingdoms of the world he served... And this one has been overtaken, and yet this new king has him in a high position because he's so gifted. Listen to Daniel 6.1. It, it seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps. Think of those guys as like governors over the kingdom, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. And over them, three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them and that the king might not suffer loss. So what that says is, here's Darius is the king. He can do anything he wants. Under Darius, he appointed three commissioners. Daniel is one of those three. And then there's 120 people under them. And they rule the whole kingdom. So that means you got the king and three guys. Daniel is one, then 120. And these guys are ruling the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. That's the picture. Now listen to what happens. This, then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. So you get the picture. Daniel is so good at what he does. He's so extraordinary that the king's going to make him over the whole kingdom. So it's going to be Darius, Daniel, and then 122 guys. And you can imagine these guys don't like that. 
this foreigner is going to be over them, and these powerful men don't like it, and they begin to be jealous of Daniel, and they're envious of him, and they want to get him. And in verse 4, it says, Then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could find no grounds of accusation or evidence of corruption, and as much as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Now, I want to make sure you hear this. 122 of the most powerful men in the country and all of those that serve them are out to get Daniel. They're looking for everything. I don't know about you. I don't want to have 122 of the most powerful men in the country looking out for my junk. I, just saying, and you probably don't either. They're looking for some misconduct in some way, shape, or form. But the scripture says they could find no grounds, no grounds of accusation in any place in his life. It says there was no corruption in him. He had integrity in everything he did is what that means. In everything he did, he had integrity. Secondly, he was faithful. He was faithful to his boss. He was faithful to his job. He was faithful to his God, always. And then number three, there was no negligence in him. In other words, he was good at what he did. There was excellence in everything he did, and these guys could find nothing that he did that they could bring him down for. And you say, was, was that the secret of Daniel, his great giftedness and his integrity? No. That's not the secret that made him extraordinary. The secret that made him extraordinary is tucked away in verse 5. Listen to it. Then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Now, do you understand what they're saying? They're saying the only way we can do something to accuse Daniel of something and hold him accountable and get him out of this position is if we create a dilemma in his life where he has to go against the law of his God because he will not go against the law of his God. See what they're saying? He has so much integrity and he's so committed to the living God that we know he won't go against him. And, and that's what they do. They devise a plan to go after him. But that's the secret. The secret to Daniel's extraordinary life was his unreserved commitment to the living God and to his word. That was the secret to his life. And, and, so, they, they, and they, so they come up with this plan. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to Darius and we're going to say, Darius, and they did this. Darius, you know what? We, 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 need, we need you to declare this law of the Medes and Persians. And by the way, when you have a law of the Medes and Persians, it cannot be changed. If it had been still under Nebuchadnezzar's reign, the law could have been changed, but not with the Medes and Persians. And, and king, this is what we want to do. We want you to be God for a month. No one can pray to any God or any man for the next month. If anyone prays to any God or any man for the next month, they're to be thrown in the lion's den. And I guess they caught the king in a weak moment, and he thought that sounded good to him. People could only pray to him. And so he signed this law of the Medes and Persians that no one could pray to any God but him for the next 30 days. And scripture says that Daniel did what he always did in verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he went to his house. Now he's there alone. And he kneeled and prayed and thanked God like he always did. He prayed to God. And they used his faithfulness against him. They just happened to be walking by Daniel's window while he was praying to catch him praying. Yeah. They knew Daniel would not stop praying to his God. Because he was committed to his God. And so they bring him before the king and said, this guy's disobeyed the law of the Medes and the Persians. Verse 14 tells us the king did not want Daniel to be thrown to the lion's den. The king liked Daniel. I mean, so much that he made him number two in all the land. And, and, it, and it even says that the king fasted for Daniel. When Daniel was put in the lion's den, the king fasted for him. The king tried to find a way to get Daniel out of it, but he couldn't. And Daniel was put in the lion's den. You know the story. The next morning, the king couldn't sleep. The Bible tells us the king couldn't sleep all night. This godless king couldn't sleep. He fasted for Daniel. The scripture says, at the break of day, the king went immediately to the lion's den. And when he come near the den to Daniel, he, said, he cried out with a troubled voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, listen to what the king says, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions. Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. And they've not harmed me. And as much as I was found innocent before him and also toward you, O 
king. I've committed no crime. And the king did not like what had happened. They brought Daniel out of the lion's den and the people that had concocted this whole scheme were put in the lion's den and I don't think it turned out quite so well for them. But the king praised God because of this. Listen to verse 26. I make a decree that in all, my, all, the, domin, all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. The king didn't understand you can't force people to believe a certain way, by the way. For he is the living God. And this, he's praising God now, this king, because of Daniel. He's the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. The king understood that. That his kingdom would one day go, but God's kingdom would not be destroyed. And his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So I told you this came full circle. This is the full circle this brings us to. Because we've been talking about this principle throughout this whole series. We started with this principle back in week one. Do you remember the glasses, the week we had the glasses? And we talked about we need to have a biblical world view. Listen to the point about Daniel I said a few moments ago. The secret to Daniel's extraordinary life was his unreserved commitment to the living God and to his word. That's just another way of saying Daniel had a biblical world view. It wasn't a word in those days. I don't think there was a term worldview when Daniel was operating in Babylon or in the time of the Medes and Persians. But that's exactly how he saw the world, was through the truth of God's word as he had it. The secret to Daniel's extraordinary life was his unreserved commitment to God and to his word and to God's word. And he saw all of life through that truth. Here, here's, here's the point for us today. Regardless of whether we're living in a culture at a time where we're fighting to maintain the wonderful gift of religious liberty, what you and I have had our whole lives, religious liberty is an unbelievable gift. It's a wonderful gift. And so we need to fight to maintain it. But whether we're in a culture where we're fighting to maintain religious liberty or whether we find ourselves someday in Babylon or under the rule of the Medes and Persians or wherever we find ourselves, the secret to have an extraordinary life under God is to have an unreserved commitment to him and to his word. That's what God calls us to. In the book of Acts, early on in chapter 5, Peter and John have gone out and they're sharing Christ. People are being healed. They're telling people how they can know Christ and have life in him. And the religious authorities want to shut them up. And Peter makes a great comment. He says, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. That's God's call for us too today. We must obey God rather than man, no matter what culture we find ourselves in. Daniel has shown us, you go read all the book of Daniel, I encourage you to do it, but all the way through the book of Daniel, chapter one, two, and on, he shows us how to live with wisdom intact. And God's call for you and me as we come full circle in this series is that you and I, it's time. It's time to wake up. It's time to wise up. It's time to warm up to the world around us. We do this loving people. If you go read the book of Daniel, you'll see how he cared about even those people that were his enemies. It's time to warm up. But it's time to speak up. It is time for us to live in this culture in a way according to the truth of this book, looking to the lens of this book, and to speak into our culture the truth. Because trust me, the secular culture is speaking into us. And it's time for us to speak up. And my prayer for us as a church and for us as individuals, you and me, is to be found faithful. Living this book out. Making it the final authority for our lives. And speaking this truth into a culture that so desperately needs it. Because we love them.